Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Deputy Librarian of Congress, Robert Newland. Oh. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for the applause. That's very nice to have at the end of the day. <laughs> welcome to the Library of Congress. We're so glad you're here. And the first thing I think we should do is thank the Fresno State Chamber Singers. They were terrific. <laughs> they gave a terrific concert with our Poet Laureate this afternoon, and what a wonderful start to our evening. And as I speak, we are being live streamed to Fresno State. So Fresno State, hello, how are you? I love Fresno and I wish I was there. Each year, we close the library's literary season with an event honoring our Poet Laureate Consultant in Poetry. Tonight, we celebrate our amazing 21st Poet Laureate as he concludes his second and final term. Juan Felipe Herrera has been one of the most popular and successful Poet Laureates ever. From the moment he was appointed, he has tirelessly championed the power of poetry to connect us and empowered audiences across the country by telling everyone, you have a beautiful voice. He has put his own beautiful voice to work for all of us as well. As laureate, Juan Felipe has written poems that address pressing social issues and poems that capture the sublime in everyday life. He even wrote an inspiring poem each book is a story for his first meeting with Carla Hayden, our 14th Librarian of Congress. But he doesn't just wield a skilled pen. Juan Felipe has been one of the most active poet laureates ever. In his first term, he launched the online initiative La Casa de Colores, The House of Colors. It includes the epic crowdsourced poem La Familia, which echoed the diverse voices of America. He also produced the video series Har uh, El Jardin, The Garden, in which he walked viewers through some of the library's surprising treasures. For his second term, Juan Felipe focused on connecting with youth. He launched the Technicolor Adventures of Catalina Neon, an online collaboration with illustrator Juana Medina which swept second and third graders into the wonders of the creative process. He also launched Word Street Champions and Brave Builders of the Dream, a year-long project with Chicago Public Libraries and the Poetry Foundation, which, excuse me, Chicago Public Schools, Chicago Public Libraries and the Poetry Foundation, which gave educators new strategies for teaching poetry. For his final project, Juan Felipe created the Laureate Lab, Visual Wordist Studio, an innovative space in the library of California State University in Fresno, his hometown. Here, Juan Felipe mixed poetry, song, and art in wonderfully dynamic programs for his local community. That's where Juan Felipe dreamed up today's celebration, which he has named Speak the People, the Spark, El Poema. We begin this evening with the discussion of Latino culture and its contributions to our national heritage. Joining Juan Felipe here on stage will be Marta Gonzalez, a Chicana artivista, musician, and assistant professor of Chicano Latino studies at Scripps Claremont College, as well as a singer, songwriter, and percussionist for the Grammy Award-winning band Quetzal. Hugo Morales, the founder and director of uh, Radio Bilingue, the leading Latino public radio network and content producer for the nation's broadcasting system, and a MacArthur Genius Fellow. And Luis Pereira, 
excuse me, Louis Perez, the songwriter, percussionist, and guitarist for the multi-Grammy award-winning band Los Lobos, which he co-founded in 1973. Their discussion titled, Let Us Gather in a Flourishing Way, after Juan Felipe's seminal poem, will be moderated by Rafael Perez Torres, who is a distinguished author, literary critic, and English professor at U UCLA. Following the discussion and after a short break, we are delighted to welcome Marta and other members of Quetzal to the stage for one of their amazing performances. I have to confess to you that I did a lot of practice of the Spanish names. <laughs> I was a French major in college. So when I got to El Jardin, I wanted to say Le Jardin. Um, but I, I have to say um, that I was able to get through this because of the wonderful Maria Rana, um, who is here with the Library of Congress. Marie, thank you for getting me through, getting, for coaching me. I'm going to need a lot more in the future. In my last two minutes, I'm going to go off um, script just a moment. Several uh, weeks ago, the library uh, received the archive of a wonderful photojournalist, Bob Edelman. Bob sadly died over a year ago, and um, his archive has come here. He was an extremely interesting photojournalist. He was a confidant of Martin Luther King and Andy Warhol. How's that for a range? But he took wonderful photos, and my dream is one day we'll have an exhibit of his works here. When we received the gift, we had a celebration of, of Bob's life, and Juan Felipe composed a poem in his honor. And it was so moving and so inspiring um, and captured Bob so beautifully. So I became really, um, I guess, inspired by Juan Felipe's, um, uh, his ability to write this, this wonderful poem. And I decided that I would write a poem in his honor. Now, I know that takes a lot of chutzpah. Uh, <laughs> I've, I've never written a poem in my life. <laughs> but what can I say? Juan Felipe inspired me. So my poem consists of 50 stanzas. No. Uh, I, pr I promise I can, I can read it to you in under a minute. But I have to say I really enjoyed writing it. Uh, Juan Felipe's tenure here has just been so joyful and has enriched me so much and just opened me up to the whole potential of poetry um, that I wanted to do something to thank him and really honor him. So here goes. My poem is titled J.F.H. J. Juan, a journey full of wonder and surprise revealed as poet, performer, writer, cartoonist, anthropologist, teacher, activist, poet laureate, yet a son of migrants who never forgets. F. Felipe, Allen Ginsberg revealed from time to time through landscapes and language, a panoramic vision always reminding us of risk, of children, of suffering, of family, of anguish and time. H. Herrera, humble yet full of the devil <laughs> and full of Bob Dylan and Woody Guthrie and Spalding Gray and Frida Kahlo and Cat Stevens and Rosa Parks and farmers and sorrow and loss. J. F. H., poet laureate, poet for life. The end. <laughs> Well, well, thank you for flattering me with that applause. I feel, I feel a little better and nobody threw anything at me. So without further ado, uh, may I present our poet laureate, Juan Felipe Herrera, and our distinguished guests. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.
That's great. That's beautiful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. We very much appreciate it. Um, and I think we're in for a very special evening of stories and music. Um, and I'd just like to say it's my great honor to be here. It's my great privilege to be here. Uh, and to welcome you all this evening at the closing ceremonies, uh, recognizing and celebrating the tenure of Juan Felipe Herrera as our Poet Laureate of the United States. I just, I think uh, his poetry is significant to us because it sings to our hearts. It touches each one of us, but it also speaks of the earth. Uh, it speaks of history. It speaks of time. Uh, it connects us profoundly to a felt sense of place, both in terms of being in a specific geography, but also living in history and being connected to an extensive history. Uh, uh, he makes us feel located in a continuum of belonging, whether it be our roots as Americans indigenous to this continent, or be it as the result of uh, our ancestors or us individually flying or walking or swimming, uh, however we got to the United States to become a part of this union, and this union that Juan Felipe as U.S. Poet Laureate represents. We're here to recognize Juan Felipe's voice as it has contributed to our sense of belonging in the world, our sense of connection to each other, and our sense of recognition of ourselves through his poetry. So I'd like to invite Juan Felipe to read, first off, uh, a poem, Let Us Come Together in a Flourishing Way, which our evening is dedicated to, and then to talk maybe for a few minutes about his experiences with the Floricanto movement in the 1970s, the Chicano poetry movement that brought art and social activism together uh, and brought them together in a collective dedicated to transforming the world in which they lived and the world in which they thought we would be living in. So if Juan Felipe, please, I invite you to share your words with us. Want me to share some words? With you. <laughs> <clears throat> about those times? <laughs> about those times. But if you would read the poem, okay. if you would read the poem for us. Okay, I just didn't know which words. <laughs> yeah, no, that'd be perfect. Uh, yes, this is 1970, uh, 71, and I was walking uh, down Campbell Hall in UCLA, and uh, out of nowhere, I, I, the phrase, let us gather in a flourishing way, just came to me. And I really enjoyed that phrase. I said, that's, that's something that I want to write about. Let us gather in a flourishing way, with sun loose grains abriendo los cantos, que cargamos cada día en el young pasto nuestro cuerpo, para regalar y dar feliz perlas, pearls of corn flowing, árboles de vida en las cuatro esquinas. Let us gather in a flourishing way, contentos, llenos de fuerza, to vida, filled with strength, for life giving nacimientos, giving birth, giving new beginnings to fragrant rios, dulces, frescos, verdes, turquoise strong, carne de nuestras hijas, hijos, rainbows. Let us gather in a flourishing way. In la luz, in the light, in la carne, in the flesh of our heart to toil. Tranquilos in fields of blossoms, juntos to stretch Los brazos together, tranquilos, in peace. With the rain in la mañana, temprana estrella, early morning, daybreak star on our forehead, cielo de calor, heaven of heat, and wisdom to meet us, where we toil siempre, always, in the garden of our struggle and joy. Let us offer our hearts a saludar, to greet, or Aguila rising freedom a celebrar, woven brazos, branches, piedras, 
stones and cacti, nopales and plumas and feathers, piercing and bursting figs and aguacates and avocados, ripe mariposa, butterfly fields, y mares claros and clear oceans and clear seas of our face to breathe todos, all of us, in el camino, on the road, on this road, blessing, seeds to give, to grow, my slan, the sacred city, in las manos de nuestro amor. Can you tell us a little about, about that period and then the period that came just after that? It's, it's kind of indescribable. Uh-huh. You know, uh, you, put, uh, you put, let's see, uh, you put uh, frijoles, you put affirmative action, you put Ernesto Galarza, you put brown berets, you put Jimi Hendrix, you put murals, you put uh, Chicanas wearing burgundy berets, you put Whittier, you put uh, the Chicano moratorium, you put uh, leaving home for the first time ever. First time, first generation, um, wild, to go to that place called, I don't know, is it UCLA? Is it a new time, a new epoch, a new world? I was so used to being, to live with my mother and my father, in little tents and little trailers, and then in apartments and sofas. And that day came when that big envelope from UCLA came. And Alurista, who I had met in 1962 uh, when we were both in uh, middle school, who became one of our pioneering Chicano uh, poets, uh, who uh, started cracking the uh, anthropology books. And uh, one day he says, Juan Felipe, I go, yes? Today I'm a Chicano. I said, well, were you yesterday? <laughs> 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 and uh, so it was like that, you know, I was playing in the last coffee houses that were still alive in uh, uh, the mid-60s. Uh, one of them was in La Mesa, California. It was called, uh, uh, it was called uh, Bifrost Bridge. So we would go there, Alurista and I, and we'd jump in, and uh, he'd play congas, and he borrowed congas, and I'd get up there with a harmonica that I didn't know how to play, while uh, there was a guitarist playing blues, while people in the audience were drinking cider, hot cider with cinnamon sticks in it. And uh, the, the folk song movement was you know, flourishing. And I'd be off key while people were singing, um, I've been a pauper, a pirate, a poet, and a key, you know, <laughs> something like that. And so you put all that stuff together, and then you put uh, the uh, explosion of the farm workers' union movement and the pilgrimages from all the way to Sacramento with La Virgen de Guadalupe on a standarte, and you put uh, uh, treks to Mexico, treks to Cuba, and treks back and living on uh, rice and water. One of our fabulous ideas. We're living on rice and water and, um, in the Logan and, uh, in San Diego and San Francisco and uh, getting very excited about the fact that we actually had a voice and we could, wanted to cast it in as many ways as possible. And we, soon we started to work in groups and um, form groups, form theater groups, political theater groups, student groups, uh, collectives and work with other collectives in San Francisco for sure. And the women began to uh, gather in cottages and they rented cottages uh, uh, as a collective. And uh, all of a sudden they were like living in their own world and the woman world and asserting their world in their own terms. And the, Mur- the murales were going up in LA, East LA and San Diego, all across California and uh, the Southwest and Texas and San Antonio. So all that is taking place. Mm. Uh, while this poem is uh, beginning to cook and to be recited. Because all of a sudden, it was really not about writing. It wasn't about being a poet. It was about uh, standing up and speaking and for our communities and to uh, uh, open up and break open uh, those vaults that uh, had been there, had been buried, that had our stories, our words, our symbols and signs, and in many ways, our people. Mm. And we wanted to uh, break open those, those vaults and uh, be, uh, step into freedom. And words and poems and songs and music uh, 
were a part of that effort and project. And I'm so happy that we're here today, uh, echoing these things, actually recreating and, and, and starting anew with our great uh, panel today and everyone that's here in our chamber singers once again. Mm. It's, it's beautiful. <laughs> And the idea of voice uh, and sharing voice and collecting voices is one of the things that we want to talk about today as a, as a panel uh, in order to get to uh, some sense of both the, the legacy that Juan Felipe has left us collectively as, as poet laureate, but also how he's working within a tradition, a Latino literary cultural tradition that brings many of us together uh, and that carries with it certain values uh, that have transformed the, the, the national culture and that uh, have productively uh, contributed to the national culture. And so I'd like uh, to introduce the, the rest of the panel to you, and I'd like each of them uh, in turn to maybe just talk a little bit about how they come, came to the idea of uh, the realization of voice, having a voice, wanting to share a voice, and wanting to share their voice with others uh, to, to uh, form new collectives and, and to both think in terms of the social world that that they inherited and that we have inherited and that we envision transforming, but also the aesthetic world, the cultural world, the artistic world that these, these artists have worked very hard as well to transform uh, and transform the media that each of these individuals has used in order to, to challenge the nature of that media as that media challenges the nature of our social order and our social hierarchies. So, uh, Marta, if you don't mind, I'd like to introduce to you Marta Gonzalez, uh, my friend and uh, Chicana uh, activista, artist, and artivista, as she calls herself, a musician, a feminist music theorist, assistant professor at the Intercollegiate Department of Chicana Chicano Latina and Latino Studies at Scripps College in Claremont, California. She is uh, a brilliant scholar as well as a brilliant musician, and she has uh, received uh, fellowships from the Fulbright uh, Foundation, from the Ford Foundation, and from the Woodrow Wilson Fellowship Foundation, uh, which is very impressive for a young uh, scholar uh, uh, who's just, uh, I won't say starting out, in fact, she's, she's contributed quite a bit already to our field, uh, and both musically and intellectually. And her academic interests, and this is what's beautiful about her career, is that she, it, her academic interests and her musical interests intertwine and combine and are completely inseparable and are, are beautifully organic. And indeed, her own uh, academic interests are fueled by her musicianship as a singer-songwriter for the Grammy Award-winning band Quetzal, who will be performing later today uh, for us. And Quetzal, as you know, has made considerable impact in both the Los Angeles music scene, but the Latino music scene and the folk music uh, scene in the States uh, more broadly. She and her partner Quetzal Flores have been instrumental in catalyzing the transnational dialogue between Chicanas and Latina communities in the United States and the Jarocho communities in Veracruz, Mexico, the Jarocho, uh, is a form of rhythm, a form of music that is, that is a tra typically traditional uh, of that region of Mexico, and it's just an, an extraordinarily rich uh, uh, form of music uh, and that has very, very deep roots, both in indigenous sounds and in African sounds. Uh, in 2014, her stomp box, which is, was uh, featured earlier on the stage, you may have seen it, it was used as a That's platform. A that's an old one. I mean, is that a, a borrowed one. A borrowed one. Yeah. The, it's called a tarima, which is a stomp box used for dancing. Her tarima was acquired by the National Museum of American History because of the uh, wonderful work that she and Quetzal have undertaken in terms of uh, musicianship and their work for the community. Uh, Quetzal has just released a new album, The Eternal Get Down, which is uh, being released by Smith's, Smithsonian Folkways label. Uh, and it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Marta Gonzalez. I'd like to say, first of all, that it's a real honor to be up here with these wonderful artists, these thinkers, and our very own poet laureate. It's, it's such an honor for me to be here, and I really, I'm... I was all torn up in the bathroom and I just couldn't, because I thought, like, what am I doing here? Anyhow, 
little while ago, TMI. <laughs> but I had to say that because I really feel so in much influenced directly in some and some indirectly by all of these men up here in some way. And so I'm very, I'm very happy to be here. And I'm also proud to be one of the few women up here as well. The only woman up here. But, right? <laughs> But just so you know, there are many others. And, uh, and one of the, thinking about voice, I think I've, there are two things I'd like to say about that. And one of the things is, first of all, you need to see an example, right? Uh, to find your voice for me was seeing somebody else express, the, like the beautiful words that our poet laureate said today, where you hear yourself, as you were saying earlier, they put a mirror to your face and show you just how beautiful your culture is and how it's not bad to mix English and Spanish and to even create new language like Spanglish, right? And to say it in such a way that makes you so, fills you with pride, where you, where you, uh, you fluff up like a happy chicken, you know, because you're so excited to be there. And most of all, as he's mentioned Campbell Hall, I too went to UCLA, I have an undergraduate degree in ethnomusicology, and I know even though this wonderful man walked, graced the hallways of this place, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, there are elements of, at UCLA that haven't always necessarily changed that much, but I imagine it was even more desolate back in the day. But in my time, uh, you could run into a great scholars, and uh, of course, but um, to know that, uh, that um, well, Juan Felipe Herrera has been there, and to know that he's uh, influenced our, 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 the trajectory and body of work that we have as poets is, is, is extremely, um, uh, impactful. Now, so for me, it's been to see witness uh, and readings uh, such as these, such as uh, Sandra Cisneros, Lorna Di Cervantes, uh, este, Sherry Moraga, uh, so many poets that reflected my experience. So well, the first thing is an example. The second thing I think for me has been uh, the opportunity to have a mic in your face and to be able to say something yourself once you're like, somebody puts a mic in your face and you say, okay, go ahead. Say what you're thinking, say what you want to, what are you thinking, what do you want to contribute, what do you want to say? And uh, at some point, you take it seriously, and you're given the opportunity, and then you're like, wow, nobody's ever asked me what I think, what I, what I envision for the future, what I can imagine, what I stand to create, right? What I stand to contribute. And uh, that's another big feat. Uh, so first it was the example of seeing these mujeres and other uh, wonderful poets, uh, express themselves, but then for me it was also having the opportunity and I think my band Quetzal and when I met my partner Quetzal Flores where he said we would do covers and then he said why don't you write something and I said what? I'm, tell me what to sing and he goes I'm not going to tell you what to sing, you're the singer, sing, say something and I was like damn what am I going to say <laughs> so and the next thing you know I had to write and when I had to write I really started paying attention to wordsmithing and how things were being put together and that became really exciting and so the example and then the opportunity yeah. Great. Super. thank you <laughs> next i'd like to introduce hugo morales uh, who is the executive director of radio bilingue the national latino public radio network hugo is a mestico, mestizo indian from oaxaca mexico my my family's home state so we have quite a bit in common there. He immigrated to the U.S. at the age of nine with his family to Sonoma County, and he joined his father uh, working in the California farm fields at the age of nine. He attended public school in rural California and eventually uh, attended Harvard College and Harvard Law School. And even during those years, he continued to work in the fields with his family during his summers. Hugo confounded Radio Bilingue in Fresno, uh, California in 1976 with other farm workers and artists Radio Bilingue now has 12 full-power FM radio stations serving the Southwest and the U.S.-Mexican border and has 60 radio station affiliates in the United States and Mexico. In 1994, Hugo received a MacArthur Foundation Fellowship, which you may know of by its alternate name, which is the Genius Fellowship, uh, and he subsequently uh, received the CPB Edward R. Murrow Award and the Cultural Freedom Award from the Lenin Foundation. Hugo is married to Amy Kitchener, a member of the board of American Folklife Center in Washington, D.C., and they have twin boys, age eight. They make their home in Fresno, California, 
But tonight, he is here with us in Washington, D.C., and it's my great pleasure to introduce Hugo Morales. Gracias, Rafael. Gracias. Ese es el nombre de mi padre. Rafael, Rafa. So, thank you very, very much. My father is... Uh, um, name, Rafael. So, um, I, he, uh, Rafael asked me to talk about, you know, uh, what made me uh, raise my voice or, uh, or, or speak out. And, you know, in, in, I'm an Indio, a uh, Mixteco from Oaxaca. In our cultura, in our culture, traditional Indian culture, we, um, uh, as children, we're not supposed to challenge or talk back or ask questions of adults or question adults. So as a child, it was very difficult, uh, obviously, because I could not ask anything of the adults. Uh, even in school, it was a one-way um, experience in the sense that the teachers uh, essentially lectured or gave the lesson. Ooh, I think that your mic is a little... We want to make sure your mic is like rubbing. There we go. Okay, yeah? Yeah. Okay, much better. Okay. So... Um, Anyway, which I'll talk about a little later about, about technology and raising your voice. <laughs> uh, so anyway, so I, it was very interesting because, uh, you know, as a, as a child, like any child, you have a lot of questions, right? Like, what's the world about, among other things. But I could not ask that of, of my elders. And I was raised by a single mom because my father, Rafael, was in the United States, uh, you know, working. Uh, so... Um, so anyway, so, so what happened is that as a child, I was actually very timid and a mama's boy. I was always with my mother and being protected. So, but, but then my father legalized in around 1957, and then the next year he brought the whole family. I have an older brother who's four years my senior, and then I have a younger sister, a year younger. So we joined him in Hillsborough, California, which is in Sonoma County. And uh, so... <clears throat> It was very interesting because there's where I got introduced to multiculturalism. Uh, I was able, I, I did pick prunes and the other crops with poor black kids, poor white kids, uh, Filipinos, single men, and so on. And um, so all this kind of came together, uh, you know, at the age of nine. And um, so and we lived in, a, you know, I, I think he moved around in, in, in different fields. We lived in one, one labor camp which we stayed there uh, in Hillsburg. So it was very interesting for us. It was very exciting to see uh, migrant workers like Felipe's family to come by. We were always wondering, like, uh, you know, meeting new kids in the summers. So anyway, um, so it was around, I think, 19, in, uh, when I was uh, 12, 13 years old, I, was, I, I really realized that I had to speak out. And of course, I was brought here to the United States, so I didn't have any bilingual education or English is a second language or anything like that. I had to pick up English on my own. So by the age of 12, I, I, I developed tuberculosis. So I, 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 had, I was in, in a sanitarium for a whole year in isolation. So with no bath, no bathroom, no radio, no TV, except books. So that was the gift that I was given uh, in that time. And so I began to read about what uh, some of the people uh, thought that were not farm workers thought about poor people, about maybe they deserve to be poor, right? They didn't take advantage of opportunities. And so that's when I, I and other things they thought, negative things they thought about us, poor people, who were dirty, not deserving, et cetera. Uh, and also we deserve to be poor because we didn't have the initiative or the energy or the intelligence. So that's when I decided to speak out. And so after that, uh, this was 1962, this way before the farm worker movement, after I got out, of course, the farm worker movement began. And so after that, I began, when I got to high school, where my uh, UFW pin, wherever I could, you know, in, in, in high school. And then I ended up at Harvard College and Harvard Law School. And then when I got to uh, Harvard, I, uh, I started a radio show, a uh, WHRB. And that had a, a uh, the radio station, which is student run, had a uh, restriction that only Harvard College graduates could operate it. But yet there were no Puerto Rican. Uh, students uh, enrolled at Harvard College at the time. So what I did is I, I called, I did a call out to the community from the radio station, which is the entire Boston area, and that's how I got Boricuas to participate 
on the radio. And I just, so I gave the voice in a way, you know, to the Puerto Rican community in Boston, back in acting from 70 to 75. And, and then also to other Latinos. So in fact, I ended up being the engineer, shall we say, the sound engineer of all things, uh, and so on. And then I got the idea of, 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 of radio bilingue because I had seen my brother establish the first radio show north of San Francisco on Sundays on a commercial uh, sh uh, station in Santa Rosa. And I saw all the farm workers uh, listening in the Sonoma, Napa County. And that's where I learned the power radio. And so now with Radio Bilingue, we get to listen to Juan Felipe Herrera, invite the audience to be part of the longest poem in the world. And, uh, and, and hear the other voices of workers and, and people throughout the world. So anyway, that's what made me uh, speak out. Thank you. And to my left is Louis Bettis, uh, who is an American songwriter, an American percussionist, a painter, a prose writer, a guitarist, composer. For the multi Grammy award-winning and Rock and Roll Hall of Fame nominated band, Los Lobos. Woo! Right. You may not know, however, that, that uh, Louis is the group's primary lyricist and uh, he is a keen observer of the human condition, if you know his work, which has been showcased on every Los Lobos recording, beginning with A Time to Dance in 1983 and up through their most recent album, Gate of Gold, in 2015. Pettis also co-wrote songs with his writing partner, David Hidalgo, for two critically acclaimed albums by Latin Playboys, their side project, and he wrote songs as well for Tony Kushner's 1994 theatrical adoption of Bertolt Brecht's The Good Person of Szechuan. He is co-writing uh, a book based on a song he wrote called Evangeline, The Queen of Make-Believe. Uh, and this play premiered at the Bootleg Theater in Los Angeles. His songs, his many songs, have been covered by extraordinary artists including Waylon Jennings, Jerry Garcia, and Robert Plant, among others. His prose has been published in many places, and he has served as the director for a number of album packages and as artistic director for a number of uh, albums, including Los Lobos box set El Cancionero, Mas y Mas, which was nominated for a Grammy Award for Best Box Recording Package. Mm. As a visual artist, Perez has shown his painting and sculpture since 1975 in many prominent galleries and museums across the nation and across Los Angeles. He's currently working on a career retrospective book of his lyrics, and we're going to work together to get that uh, finished. Uh, and uh, this is a book of lyrics, writings, and art that will be published soon. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Louis Perez. And you forgot to mention I'm also who was a uh, sound technician. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, it, it's really an honor to be here uh, to celebrate um, with Maestro Herrera. We were uh, talking a bit in the green room about uh, uh, when we first met back in the early 70s in Balboa Park at uh, uh, Centro Cultural in San Diego, <clears throat> way back when. Uh, our hair was about a foot longer and a lot darker. <laughs> uh, and it's, 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 great to, it's great to be here. Um, the thing started, this, uh, this crazy thing uh, called art started with me uh, uh, a long time ago when I was uh, a kid growing up in East LA. Um, and actually, you know, it was kind of like a process of elimination. Um, I was a terrible dancer and, uh, and I, you know, uh, couldn't swim to save my life, and I was even a worse uh, baseball player, so I became a musician. <laughs> uh, 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 as an inspiration, I think, you know, I, I was listening to Mexican music that my mother played at home. She sang uh, at home and um, inspired me in many ways. Uh, of course, I listened to uh, radio, um, Mexican music when I was very little, and by the time I got old enough to be able to reach the knob on the radio, I discovered choice. 
And that's when uh, Jimi Hendrix, James Brown, and everybody in between uh, came into my life. My mother bought me a guitar when I was about 12 years old in her own sort of a youth diversion program. <laughs> uh, I, th I think it was probably partly to keep me off the street because she loved music too. Um, that was an inspiration. Uh, she also inspired me by the things that she did. Um, uh, I was uh, also, you know, grew up without a father. Um, he died when I was about eight years old. And, um, and uh, thank goodness for strong women, right? Mm -hmm. uh, she taught me by her, her um, um, example, uh, by uh, feeding uh, homeless people on my front porch. You know, um, one day when I came up the, the walk, she was, uh, there was a homeless person uh, drinking out of my Kool-Aid mug that I had sent for in the mail. And uh, I was kind of appalled by that. And then I realized that my mother was actually teaching me something. Mm -hmm. She was teaching me that uh, in this life we really don't own anything. And if we do, we have to share with others. So um, musically, uh, you know, I, I, um, I listened to everything that I could, I could get my hands on. And Los Lobos formed in 1973. Um, for, for uh, kids uh, growing up in East L.A. And uh, uh, we, f we put away electric guitars uh, because we were all in rock bands and we uh, formed this band uh, to play uh, traditional Mexican music, which was unheard of at the time. You know, uh, we were typical early 70s kids with long hair and flannel shirts and beat-up jeans uh, playing Mexican music, so it was kind of unheard of at the time. But... Uh, and at the same time, uh, the um, uh, ringing as a parallel was the Chicano Movimiento. And uh, we lent our musical services to, uh, to Cesar Chavez and, Mer and the, the um, United Farm Workers and uh, just about anything, uh, any uh, Chicano cause that was uh, you know, happening at the moment, which were many. Uh, we found a regular gig and playing matches all, uh, all over California at all the... Uh, <laughs> the um, uh, state colleges and universities. Uh, my work has always been inspired by, the, by uh, my early life growing up uh, in, the, in East Los Angeles. It's a wellspring of, of, of beauty and, 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 and pain and sorrow and, uh, and joy. It's just uh, this, this mezcla, this thing that, that, uh, that all Chicanos uh, have become uh, quite acquainted with. Um, and so I draw from that from all of my work. Um, it's a, a bombless uh, amount of, of uh, and bountiful uh, amount of, uh, of experience that I can draw from. And um, I can't say a, enough about where we come from, and that's something that it, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll never forget and still carries, uh, I carry with me close to my heart to this day. Beautiful. So I, I think our speakers have, have, have each noted their, the way in which their connection to locale, to region, to place, uh, and, and then the influence of others who came before, that the, the importance of, of parents, the importance of role models, the importance of, of uh, uh, figures who we can, whose model we can draw upon. Uh, whose images and whose lessons we can draw upon in order to move things forward, uh, in order to transform and move things forward. And, and earlier, uh, uh, Juan Felipe in, in his poetry had stated uh, this, this, this afternoon in the previous uh, event, our ancestors give us their voice, right? Our ancestors give us their voice to speak again. That's a beautiful sentiment, and I think that, that encapsulates the sense of tradition uh, and the commitment to tradition that is a part of uh, Latino culture, Latino heritage, um, and a, a part of what uh, gives Latino communities a sense of strength and a sense of purpose. But I, I, I'd like to ask each of our panel uh, members what, what tradition signifies, what it means to them. Uh, what, what is tradition as far as being a wellspring 
but also perhaps being a source of concern. Are there traditions that perhaps are best left behind? Um, what, how do we, um, what is the significance of tradition as we move forward? And tradition as that which connects us to the past and allows us to move into the future. Um, how do you see tradition as working or tradition as working in, in um, the, please, Ugo. Well, for me, <clears throat> for me as a Mixteco, I think there's some traditions that are best left behind. I think the violence against women, for example, should be stopped. Mm -hmm. um, alcoholism, I think, should be stopped among my people. There's just too much, too much alcohol consumption among Indians. And uh, to me, it appears to me it's a conspiracy by the, I don't know by whom, definitely corporations, to keep us drunk and not work for our own well-being and our own families. It's just such a terrible thing to see drugs and violence among our Mixteco native peoples. And it's, uh, it is, you know, there's a lot of bright, talented folks. And, and so I like to see that go away. But what I do want to say is that there's incredible amount of treasures among our Mixteco people, like in the arts. Uh, you know, pottery, for example, or uh, mask making, dance of the, of, of the Diablos that, uh, that, that celebrates uh, our spirit as Indios and our spirit uh, in our hearts. And we, and we dance to the beauty of our people and the beauty of, of, our future, of the future in our souls. That, you know, the, the, that's, 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 that's it. And our music, to me, just really hits our heart because uh, it's, it's, it's not sophisticated, but yet it really hits our heart. And uh, whether, we, whether it be strings or whether it be wind bands, it's just so beautiful. It really brings the sense of community together, and it's so beautiful. And, uh, and, and also our sense of organization. Uh, a lot of people, uh, at least in California, who know are familiar with the Mixteco community says, you folks are the most organized people among the Latinos. And in some communities, we are. <laughs> and, and, and it's because, you know, in our own homeland, we're not united, but we come here and we're being discriminated against. You know, we're not, in, in, our, in our place, let me just give one example, Madera County, we're just north of Fresno County, is the highest concentration of Ixtecos outside of um, Mexico. And there, uh, you know, all of us Mixtecos are farm workers there in Madera County, right by Fresno County. And where do we get our greens, right? Our good, our good stuff. It's from um, uh, the, the remate, you know, it's, it's, it's the, it's, it, which is on Sundays. Like, that's the only day we don't work. So what does the mainstream do? It's in the fairgrounds. They charge people $1 to come in. Every, every head is $1. I mean, I don't see people going to, you know, I don't know, the Giant or whatever, whatever, uh, you know, any, any kind of grocery store and having to pay to get in. Mm -hmm. You know, but that's the kind of exploitation, you know, that we face. So I, I, I see that uh, there's a lot uh, we need to preserve as, as Indios and also our identity. I think that's one of the things that my father really uh, uh, instilled on, me, on us as a family. We so we should be proud to be Indios. We have a rich history. We have a rich tradition, traditions, and there's a lot for us to contribute to this community to make America even better than what it is. So anyway, that's, that's what I see. Okay. When these changes that you talk about, I think are really important because if that's the, I believe that tradition is, is a social construction. So when the people want to change something that is not beneficial to say like women, like what you brought up, and we have the power to do that. The los, la comunidad de la que usted viene tiene esa capacidad, you know, they have that capacity to change it, to talk and to, you know. Um, but I think it's really, there's always a balance in also in traditions, right, where, uh, you know, for example, my dad believed very strongly in doing certain things and, and then uh, um, the circumstances, you know, he left when I was 11. I also grew up in Boyle Heights, East LA. Um, and uh, when he left, uh, before he left, he didn't allow English in the house whatsoever, you know. That was a tradition of the home, right? Mm -hmm. No English, nothing he couldn't understand. And then when he left, uh, you know, music and English, 
you know, the rock and roll, all of this other stuff, R&B, started coming into the house, you know, and so the circumstances were that the man was out of the house, and so my mom was like, yeah, sure, go ahead, listen to whatever you want, you know. And so we were like, yeah! <laughs> but um, that's in, in, my, in the context of our, you know, home, that was very uh, prominent, right? But so when I think about tradition in general, whether in cultures, tradi deep traditional cultures and others, I think that there's always, it's always good to have, um, when I think about my dad, I think it's great that he didn't allow English in the house because I was able to learn the language to mm. a certain extent in a way that was really important to me later, right, in terms of expression and all of these things, but in terms of, of allowing new sounds really opened my eyes to other things as well. So to have the balance of people in every tradition, the diehards that like, just want to keep it, they believe that tradition is non-static, that you just need to keep certain traditions certain ways, and then to have other people that are really, they say like, you know what, tradition needs to change, tradition is fluid, tradition is ever-changing. I think I believe in both of those things. We need those two, like, you know, yes, no. You know, we need, you know, we need that balance. And uh, some of the mm -hmm. things we need to really change, but I think there, there's, every person plays a role. I don't know. What do you think? You know, uh, th those are, uh, you know, it's such, a, such an interesting uh, thing about tradition, isn't it? Uh, you know, e everyone is a vibrant human being and every group as a vibrant life, and every culture is a vibrant, living, uh, beautiful, uh, has a beautiful system of doing all those things. And what happens is that when you put power into the picture, mm. you, you put a drop of power or a gallon of power, then one group becomes traditional and the other group becomes modern. Mm. And, uh, and then we have the, uh, the use of uh, what's seen as traditional uh, which is actually a vital human group uh, way of life uh, taken and uh, used uh, commercially. And uh, that group uh, somehow, through various processes, uh, is kind of kept at the margins. Mm -hmm. So that, that's when we run into problems. You know, uh, when we have, uh, we pee less uh, Indian women's uh, 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 weaving and, and uh, uh, let's call them blouses for the moment or, or uh, apparel uh, with uh, weaving and patterns uh, used uh, commercially when in fact if you really step into the culture and you really look uh, and it's kind of just kind of marketed mm -hmm. not really uh, without any deep uh, uh, um, uh, notions of it and uh, and used up and used in the fashion malls, and it's uh, in cartoons, and it's in uh, a number of uh, corporate uh, displays and mm -hmm. uh, uh, platforms. And the group of, with, where the material comes from is uh, kept at bay. It's kept mm. on the side and on the outside. And when, in fact, if you look at those patterns in, let's say, Mayan territory, perhaps in most of our cultural uh, weaving traditions. Uh, those symbols and colors and patterns uh, have many deep uh, stories connected to them. And, uh, and, and they're kind of the stories of the creation, stories of the universe, and the story of the village, and the story of the tejedora, the weaver. Uh, so that, that's what gets critical uh, when, I, when I look into it, when I think about it, is that uh, one group has tradition, and the other group doesn't, and, uh, and then the other group uses those, those quote-unquote traditions uh, to kind of display itself as a cultural, uh, democratic, or plural group, and yet uh, the resources are not really going to those uh, whose those quote-unquote traditions uh, are rooted in. So that, that's what uh, gets, gets me, uh, because everyone has traditions, mm -hmm. and yet somehow uh, uh, various groups or at times, uh, you know, we say, well, we don't have any more traditions, you know, we're kind of modern now, and, you know, we're, we're kind of just uh, being ourselves and being human beings, uh, wearing uh, materials and items and pixels. And, and, and the other group <laughs> is, you know, chewing corn and, uh, and you know, uh, burning uh, uh, yervas. And uh, we have to respect the yervas and the burning. See, but when you don't really know anything about it. And <laughs> you're separating uh, everyone. So that for me, it's, it's most important to, uh, to create unity and to have kind of a deeper, uh, 
connection with everyone and to, um, and to open the flow of uh, resources and let deep knowledge flow from all peoples, in particular those that we think have traditions, which they do, but not in a plastic corporate manner and a vibrant uh, human uh, evolving uh, manner, which to this very day all groups have. We just have kept each other apart or we have pushed uh, either one way or another our beautiful uh, tr uh, groups, indigenous groups to the outside and uh, feel that we are on the inside, but in fact we are on the outside. Mm. That's very, and the, 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 the notion of tradition as transforming the future rather than being separate from the future or the tradition as opposed to the modern, I think is one thing that, that, that Juan Felipe, but that everybody is, and that Latino culture in general is, is seeking to explore and understand. Uh, and as part of this, we're, uh, our, our program is running down, but I'd like uh, Juan Felipe, if he could, to read a poem uh, which actually was written by students at first, and then uh, written as part of Juan Felipe's uh, world's longest poem uh, project, which is one of the uh, poet laureate uh, projects that's been going on. And so if, if Juan Felipe, as, in order to close us out uh, this evening, and in order to share both your words and the words of, mm. of others, bringing different voices and multiple voices together, if you'd please share that with us. This is so beautiful, you know, I think every, everyone here that's here right now, uh, uh, just by uh, hanging out and saying hello again. Uh, we've all talked in one way or another of, of sharing our work already. We've already said, hey, why don't we do this together? And what are you playing? Well, I play this guitar. And what about you? Well, I just got this, this guitar recently. I had a Gretsch. And, you know, remember the radio? Yeah, we, we used to do a voz canela. Why don't we just get back into it, Marta? You know, hey, let's write a song together. So you see? So you see? So you see? Uh, that's how to do it, don't you think? Yeah. Th that's how we all can do it. Right. That's how we can do it. Yeah. It's, uh, you know, art and creativity are open doors. Art and creativity, those are open doors, like the singers. They ha they're, they're a collective uh, uh, prism of open doors. And we get inspired. We want to sing too. We want to stand up there with you. We want to clap. That's, that's the idea. And uh, that's what this is all about. So what happened is I went to... Uh, Wyoming to Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and there's a beautiful migrant community there, and the, and the Teton Library does a lot of uh, beautiful work with the migrant students, and in the high schools and the junior high schools, uh, Jackson Hole Middle School and Jackson Hole High School. So I went into the middle school into the eighth grade class, and all of a sudden, well, well uh, yes, uh, how are you? And and then the students said, well, Juan Felipe. Uh, we saw that you had a poem. Oh, very good, very good. And, 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 and uh, we noticed that you wrote a poem called uh, 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 Every Day uh, um, We Get More Illegal. I go, oh, uh, really? Is that, is that the poem you're talking about? <laughs> wow, uh, okay. Uh-huh. Well, you know, it's, it's a really good poem, Juan. Um, but, you know, um, we kind of rewrote it for you. <laughs> 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 uh, okay, I think I'm, go I think I'm going to sit down now. <laughs> and you go right ahead. And that's what they did, you know, they, this is it. And I'm telling you, it is a much better piece. It is. And the name of the poem is, Every Day We Get More Illegal. Left for America on planes, buses, vans, they said, I remember. Under the silver darkness, it is all in between the light. I imagine going through a tunnel to a better life, to a brighter future, yet we stay broken, slashed. I haven't seen my parents in nine years, my mom said. My grandma, my uncle, my entire family left in Mexico. Rare visits by the lucky ones, expired visas, borders that divide, means they won't come anymore. I don't know half of who I am missing. My dad's tarantula, my turtle, my mom's dog left behind. Depression, our hopes and dreams, our culture, our language taken away. How can America be the land of the free? 
if we can't feel it. Walking, working with our mind, our life. Jackson High Middle School, sixth grade, Latino leaders. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Please join me in thanking Juan Felipe Herrera for being Poet Laureate this wonderful year. All right, don't go away, or I should say take a 10-minute break, um, go to the restroom, go and look at the beautiful exhibits that are right out in the foyer, um, featuring some of the wonderful collections from the library, and those of you in Fresno State or listening through the Washington Post live feed, just go get something to drink, and then come back, stretch your legs, and get ready to dance, and listen to Quetzal. So 
So once you kill the microphones, we will, we will move. You know, I should make it.
Should we just start? Yeah! yeah!
se oye en la lluvia en los techos de cartón qué triste vive mi gente en los techos de cartón Takes flight, imagine. 
journey forever My healer takes flight Imagine forever like to tell stories as well through poetry and music uh, from the great tradition of Juan Felipe Herrera. Um, we have been our direct descendants of the movement that he and people like Luis Perez as well spawned. And, and so this next song is about struggle and a struggle that we saw in Mexico after seeing a child being a fire breather on the streets for change. And it wasn't because he was some part of some prestigious circus, but because he was trying to make a living for he and his family. And it was one of the saddest things I've ever seen. And this song was written as a result of that. Ay, sus sueños por la noche van el sueño que ilumina este oficio entre los coches hay este oficio entre los coches juego juego la lumbre y su dueño en cada pecho de lágrima risa si un sueño la lumbre y su dueño en cada pecho de lágrima risa si un sueño juego Sombras va, faruma no humilde ser, 
coreando desde a mi ciudad Nos brinda luz para ver Fuego, fuego, la lumbre y su dueño En cada pecho arde lágrima, risa y un sueño La lumbre y su dueño En cada pecho arde lágrima, risa y un sueño Fuego Gonzalez, everybody. We call her La Profe. <laughs> so we'd like to invite um, our, our, one of our mentors, and uh, like Marta said, the uh, person who can call us his spawn. Is that what you said? The movement he spawned. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I misinterpreted that. Luis Perez, Luis Perez, ¿dónde estás, Luis? Luis Pérez, ven a tocar con nosotros. So we talked about tradition earlier, and uh, I want Luis to say something a little bit about what he told me backstage after the talk, the panel about tradition, but as he's setting up, um, since we're talking about tradition, sorry, I'm still out of breath, okay. Um, this tune is a traditional tune that we've rocked out. It's called La Lloroncita. And of course, we learned rocking out traditional tunes by El Mero Mero right here. With Louis Perez and Los Lobos. Give it up for him, y'all. Yeah. Here we go. Pasas por el rosal 
Cuidado con las espinas Cuidado con las espinas Si pasas por el rosal Porque la sangre lastima sin poderlo remediar. Ay, de mi llorona, pero déjame llorar. Ay, de mi llorona, pero déjame llorar. A ver si llorando puede mi corazón descansar mi corazón descansar a ver si llorando puede
pensar y descansar Tailana and Omoto on violin also. We got California up here, y'all. Not too far away from East LA Shore in Monterey Park. Japanese, Thai, but speak Spanish. California. Luis se me escapó, but we're going to call him back up here in just a little bit. So, we're storytellers, and uh, we like to narrate what's happening out there, and also make connections between the past and the present, some of our problems, but also asking questions, some of our solutions that we see that are possible. And this song is called Critical Time, um, and it actually spawns, there's that word again, the title of our new album on Smithsonian Folkway is called The Eternal Get Down. Here we go. People asking why, why? Mothers crying, cry, 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 cry. Authorities building lies, it's a critical time. Books and faces, faces and books Where the truth weathers through Moving pictures, recording deaths at Spar A million man march It is no coincidence The collective skin tone of the innocent Sparks in all of us The discontent Initiating those who were once ready to sin Sparks in all of us, the discontent Initiating those who are once ready to sit. So people are asking why, 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 why Mother's crying, cry, 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 cry Authorities building lies it's a critical time Moment in time, times of the moment Riots, patrolmen, people and showmen Chanting soon dissipates as infiltrators instigate People disperse as the suffering media soon mitigates Sparks in all of us, the discontent Initiating those who are what? Reticent But how do you harness the energy of the march? How do you instill the momentum given the dark? Beyond the picket, the boycott and the trend that will soon be abated For all of these deaths are interrelated Ferguson, Emmett, Guerrero and Brown How do we initiate our people to the eternal get down? So our people won't keep asking Why, 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 why Mothers won't keep crying Cry, 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 cry Authorities won't keep building lies It's a critical time It's a critical time
okay out there? Is it? This is such a beautiful theater to play nice, quiet music, right? <laughs> Everybody's ears okay, though. We're all still doing all right? Okay. I must say, you guys seem pretty conservative when we were doing the panel. But you're kind of rockeros, right? You're rockers, you're rockers. You like the rock. Not too loud. We're kind of worried about that. Uh, so the ushers gave us permission. They said it's okay to dance in the aisles. You just can't roll down the aisles, stuff like that, okay? And if you get up and dance, I promise nobody's going to take your seat. Okay? Parcela. Ese Juan, hay bastantes 
Sobran ejidos robados y prestados Y el vivo sigue de pie, no como el muerto acostado Ay, hasta comer como crían Llamando la atención A través del mundo Aumentan los hogares de la mina y cartón Allá donde no había Solicito permiso para la vida Soy rica en esperanza Así que reto no me llevo Le daré vista, le daré vista Hasta el más ciego Soy rica en esperanza Así que reto no me llevo Estoy aquí Estoy aquí, estoy aquí Y de reto no me niego Estoy aquí, estoy aquí Estoy aquí, estoy aquí Y ahora yo veré, no te niego Estoy aquí, estoy aquí Everybody now, everybody now, everybody free, everybody now, everybody free, everybody now, everybody free, everybody now, everybody free, 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 no wall. Libre, 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 todo libre, todo libre, todo libre, 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 todo libre, no va, 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 no little one, no big one, no big one, no little one, no big 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 one, no
What's up with that? You know what I'm saying? Juan Felipe, treasure trove. We want to call up another treasure trove. Come on out here again, Louis Perez. Where is he? Give it up for Louis, y'all. Louis Perez. We can't find him. Louis, where's Olivia Pope when you need her? Louis, 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 Louis. Imagine if he like. All right, we're gonna play another one for you while we're waiting. Okay? While we're waiting for him, as soon as he gets here, we'll stop this. Wait, there he is! Yeah! Thanks a lot. Um, just want to thank Betsy and um, Betsy Peterson and uh, everybody for uh, getting us all together and bringing us out here. It's very cool. <laughs> and of course, we're all here to celebrate uh, Maestro uh, Juan Felipe Herrera's uh, tenure here. And again, thanks. Uh, here's a song about um, the little house in East LA, a room that I grew up in uh, many, many years ago. Uh, dedicated to the child in all of us, all right? It's called Same Behind the Glass. Hammer and a nail Sink behind the glass has a hammer and a nail. Baby in his arms, baby in his arms. Sink behind the glass holds a baby in his arms. Watches me sleep. Watches me sleep, sink behind the glass, watches me while I Coffee in the air, same behind the glass, smells coffee in the air. Curtains blowing around, curtains blowing around, same behind the glass, see these curtains blowing. Lays night upon my head. Mother, don't cry. Mother, don't cry. Sing behind the glass. Tells mother not to cry.
Thank you. I can't tell you what it is honored it is to be here with you guys tonight. I'm, I'm so honored and I have, have had the best time ever. So thank you so, so very much for sharing this night. Well, and it was a real pleasure. Uh, I think we're, uh, all right. We're gonna do a song called uh, Para Sanar, which means to heal. And so this uh, song uh, is in the tr great tradition and, and talking really about the kinds of things that, that I saw as a child uh, Mexicanos do to heal. And yes, we went to the medical doctor, Western medical doctor, but we also went to curanderas and sobadoras. And you had the, your grandma rub the egg all over you and <laughs> you lit the green candle when you wanted the job. And you know, you had a little powder and like, uh, you know, you fed somebody your hair when uh, you wanted them to fall in love with you. That's how I got this guy right here. Who knows what else he ate? Just kidding. No. So, potions from the curandera and the botanica, that's what we call it. This song is about healing by any means necessary through words in life. Y nuevamente. Que fulano su tano le está matando el espíritu que lo tiene sed Que no más no lo deja ver, que no más no lo deja estar Que no más no lo deja vivir en paz Fulano sutano lo está matando un espíritu que lo tiene sentado Que no más no lo deja ver, que no más no lo deja estar Que no más no lo deja vivir en paz Hay que mandarle al Padre que lo venga a curar Hay que mandarle al Padre que lo venga a curar Bendito santo un rompimiento para sanar Bendito santo un rompimiento para sanar sirve para ese espíritu inquieto que anda ese papa eh, eh, hay que mandarle al padre que lo venga a curar hay que mandarle al padre que lo venga a curar bendito santo un rompimiento para sanar bendito santo un rompimiento para sanar
you so very much, Louis Perez. Quetzal Flores. Quetzal Flores. Juan Perez on bass. We have El Mero Mero, Evan Greer on drums. Tailana Enomoto on violin. Juan Felipe Herrera on beautiful vocals and long, long legacy. Hermano, maestro. Dr. Martha Gonzalez, oh, thank you. you guys. <laughs> Oh, thank you. Are we all? I thought we were done. What? What's happening?
Library. Thank you so much. Let's give another. Let's give another hand. Oh, there we go. Let's give another hand for Quetzal and Louis Perez. Woo! Juan Felipe, Juan Felipe, come on up! Come on up! Come on! There we go, the band is complete. All right, everybody, uh, you should have some surveys. Fill them out, please. Tell us what you thought of tonight. Um, I hope you liked it. Uh, in the Widow Pavilion, Juan Felipe will sign some books. Have a great night.